we'll start everybody. Hello. Hello. My name is Robin Clayfield from Crystal Waters Community in Australia. So I'm part of an amazing community and all kinds of amazing community groups and organisations. So I'm, it's really my honour to have been host for this session and introduce you to three people who have created amazing community organisations that they're going to share with you about. I'll introduce our first presenter, Joanne Bevan. She lives in North London and has um, travelled a lot internationally and knows what it's like to be in a foreign country. Um, she speaks five languages by the sounds of it and she's created this amazing organisation that yeah, come in, guys. Yeah, Sorry. we're just about to start. Yeah. So um, she's about to talk to us about um, Speak Street, which is like a pop-up language cafe, which sounds really, really interesting. And in the interest of language and communication, what I'll ask is if there's anybody in the room who has English as a second language who would need a little bit of support with English because we can arrange that right now. Is there anyone? Put your hand up if you need support like that. Everyone's fine? Great. I'll introduce you to Joanna. So she'll speak to us for 20 minutes and then there'll be 10 minutes of question time. Hi everyone, um, I'm Joanna and I'm the founder of Speak Street Pop-Up uh, Language Cafe. And I founded this just under a year ago. Uh, it's based on permaculture design. Um, I just want to ask a question to start. How many people here speak uh, another language other than English? And how many people here, um, English isn't their first language? Cool. Okay, so quite a lot. I don't know, I think most people in life can appreciate what it's like to learn a language, even if it's just like your school French or something like that. And you learn a language, you study, and then you get to the country and all of a sudden the people don't understand what you're saying and you can't make yourself understood. So, um, really a good way to practice is by practicing with the local people. Um, I live in London, in North London, and there's 145 languages spoken in my area. But what I discovered from being a community worker is that lots of people from different countries didn't have the opportunity to, m to meet and speak with actual native English speakers. And so this, to me, was a real kind of paradox. And similarly, there were lots of English native speakers who wanted to improve their Spanish or their French, and they couldn't uh, find native speakers to practice with. So I created Speak Street, and it's a pop-up language cafe that happens in lots of uh, different areas around the community. And I just want to share with you today a little bit about that. So this is one of our sessions on the photo. Um, so I, a few years ago, I did a permaculture design course in uh, Zeeban Linden with uh, Patrick Whitefield, the late great pa Patrick Whitefield. And I thought it was brilliant. I didn't really have any background in um, gardening or any, I didn't really know anything about it. I certainly didn't have any land or any possibility that I could <coughs> use what I'd learned into actually doing something there and then. So I thought, why don't I use the principles and transfer it onto something that I can actually um, do? And I was a community development worker for many years and I also speak languages I've lived all over the world. So I thought I will apply the permaculture design principles to my project and that way I will still be practicing permaculture um, but just in a slightly different way. Um, I, so yeah, I was permaculture for the landless, I thought, because I think it's time that we can see a way that permaculture can evolve um, and build on the kind of environmental focus into other areas. <coughs> I also... Um, Something else that strongly influenced me was that I went to a City University in New York and I did some research into what makes a resilient community and I came up with seven different points. Um, and I think we're going to hear a lot more about community resilience later, but just briefly, the seven points that I came up with were social capital, um, permaculture design, community-led planning, community ownership, social equality and 
carbon footprint. So just just the area. The, yeah, so, uh, sorry, they were on the slide, but they disappeared. So social capital. Social capital is the extent to which skills and knowledge exist in the community and the extent to which they're shared around. Then there's the carbon footprint of a community. Obviously, we know if a, if a community is more self-sufficient, then it's more able to withstand um, difficulties in scarcity. Community-led planning, so the, the extent that community are involved in the organisation and planning of things, community ownership, permaculture design from the get-go, because a lot of um, problems and social issues I found came from poor planning and poor design. And finally, social equality, because if not everybody starts on the same page, then there's always going to be um, inequalities and therefore issues and weaknesses in communities. So that, together with my permaculture uh, training, really influenced uh, my work. And I pitched the idea to um, the School for Social Entrepreneurs here in London. And they gave me some funding, a little bit of funding to start it. And so last October, I launched Speak Street. Um, Speak Street is fun social learning. And it's a way to help people improve their skills and confidence. It brings <coughs> communities together and also it celebrates our diverse communities. Um, it, it's definitely a direct response in this country and, and maybe globally as well to negative uh, rhetoric towards immigration and that, this kind of thing. So I wanted to show the positive benefits that come from living in diverse communities. I was also inspired by permaculture to look at my community in a holistic way and realise that the ones who wanted to learn and there were others who wanted to give and I just wanted to connect them up like a little uh, ecosystem, neighbours helping neighbours. Um, how it works, so there's lots of pop-up sessions. Uh, for the moment we're not an actual permanent place, although maybe in the future we will be, but we exist in uh, local cafes, um, local community centres, uh, even in a free bookshop. We just pop up uh, according to where people want to do it. Uh, we've done sessions for English speakers, people improving their English, and we also do French and Spanish as well. And the model is very scalable and replicable, so it's just a case of finding people who want to do it, and we could even do other languages as well. Um, it's important for us to use local community spaces as opposed to maybe like a Starbucks or something like that because we want to be promoting a localised economy and also cut staying true to our permaculture values. Um, we also have lots of people volunteering and it was important for me to make sure that the volunteers got back something as well as giving and a lot of people said to me that they wanted to have help and experience in um, teaching and so this is a quick and easy way for people to do it they only need to come once they don't need to commit to a long time because a lot of people who um, engage volunteers find it difficult because that you demand a high commitment level from them whereas I broke it down to bite-sized volunteering and lots of little tasks that people can do um, just in a short space of time they can come to the sessions and share their English skills or even the graphic design, um, photographers, filmmakers, bloggers, they've all been uh, volunteers that I can just ask for a one-off task. And that's quite an important element of Speak Street in its success. Um, the story so far. So um, we've been in four London boroughs uh, in eight locations, and we've engaged over 300 people in the sessions, and we've have, uh, had over 100 volunteers. And um, here, maybe some people recognise are from this country, um, who's possibly the next Labour or leader of the Labour Party. He's the local MP and hopefully future <laughs> Prime Minister. And he is a long-term Speak Street supporter as well. Um, okay, so um, going back to the permaculture principles, here's just a few that I picked and I tried to use uh, within Speak Street. 
So, integrate rather than segregate. I saw that there are 145 languages spoken in uh, my area, but none of these people, they were, it's very easy to stay in their own groups. So, I looked for ways in which people would have a context to be able to meet each other and to be able to come together. Creatively use and respond to change. I looked at places, uh, for example, there's some cafes and they have very slow times and for them it's very useful to have us in there having our sessions at a time when they don't normally make much business. So although it was kind of a negative change that was happening um, in the local economy, we were able to respond to that by offering them something positive from our sessions. Uh, use and value diversity. Um, Speak Street, the, uh, the sessions of Speak Street are very focused on learning from other people's cultures and learning and interacting and that's a key part of what we do. Um, some of the sessions, for example, are things like speaking to the landlord on the telephone or um, having a job interview or discussing local politics, all the little things that um, you don't necessarily get to practice just from reading a book or studying on your own. Um, also, it's important for us to use the edges. So although an edge in the garden sense could be um, the hedge or, or you know, the side of the land, our edge is where two, the different communities meet each other. And also, the edge can be, for example, my marketing, where my communication meets the people who are responding. So I'm just using it different ways to integrate these into Speak Street. Um, just to finish, um, anyone obviously who's interested in learning more, you can come and ask me, I've got some contact details. We're holding sessions um, in the London area, but the model is that it's scalable and it can happen in lots of different places, if anyone was interested. Um, I think it's important to take the cult out of permaculture so that we can use it for things that's not like beyond what traditionally is thought by permaculture. I think it's a great um, sort of methodology and approach to life in general and for me it's been very useful and I, I definitely am keen for it to be, uh, find ways to, for it to become more mainstream. Um, so I'm very keen for that. And I think it's something that we can use in many other areas uh, of design in our communities. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. The beautiful example of social permaculture and using our permaculture principles to design social and really caring people systems. Yeah, thank you. And you finished really early. I so know. You can ask lots of questions. Yeah. So, anyone got questions for Joanna? Oh, okay. So let's let's move this way around the room. Yeah, and just short questions, and yeah, we'll do our best to get around everybody. Hi. Well, it sounds like a really interesting project. Um, I was wondering how you're getting feedback from people who are coming along in order to be able to keep a kind of evolving your design. Um, yeah, well, feedback's a, a key part of every session. Um, I've had one of the designers, because I've got lots of designers who want to help design a special form, so we can get um, both written feedback and also um, verbal feedback and just adapt it as we go. Um, obviously, Speak Street's not an accredited course, um, like someone wanting to go to college and study for an English exam. It's kind of a complementary thing to that, um, so we're not getting people to a certain exam standard or anything like that but it's about very much focusing on conversational English practice. So we just review after every session so we can just change, basically. It's not like we've got to stick to a structure, mm. like an exam, like a school or whatever. Mm. Thank you. I just, if, would you say a word about how you set it up financially? You got some money in the beginning? Yeah. Um, there's did everyone hear the question, just for a moment? Could you call yeah. it out so everyone How did you set it up financially? Just how is it sustainable? Well, first, firstly, I... I, I was trying to be like a true uh, permaculturist and set it up with nothing, uh, <laughs> uh, just by like using what there was already in the community. That's why I didn't look already for a venue. Like 
uh, higher of space, that we would inhabit spaces. Um, so at the beginning, the only cost was my time, like if I were to, to charge that or, who, or the facilitator's time. Um, but I did pitch this idea to a, um, a thing called the School for Social Entrepreneurs who, who fund social en enterprise and they, get, they thought it was a good idea so they gave me some money to kind of professionalise it a bit more, get things going. Um, the model as well is the social impact of um, speech Street is to help people, uh, immigrants, migrants, refugees <coughs> in my area to uh, integrate and to, uh, with the community. Um, so they don't pay, but people learning French and Spanish pay a small amount, so that, um, so that kind of pays for that. Also, um, the next evolution of Speak Street is that local um, big corporations in the city of London, uh, like banks, are very interested to get Speak Street into their offices, and they will pay a corporate price for it to cross-subsidise the sessions that happen in the community. So I'm trying to create a fully sustainable model so it's not reliant on grant funding and stuff. Thank you. Who is next? Yeah. I was going to say, in terms of time frame, I don't know if you mentioned it, but I didn't hear. Um, how long did it take you to set it up to the point where you had uh, it fully running? Um, Maybe repeat the question. So how long did it take me to set to set it up before I was totally running? Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's been a little seed in my head, and I've been thinking about it, and all these kind of interactions with people. It's been growing over time. But I launched in October of last year, and, and so a bit less than a year it's got to this stage and it is just kind of going <coughs> like this it's not at the stage where um, I'm earning <coughs> I can totally live from it or anything like that but it is at the stage where we have a base we have a network we have like a strategy um, so yeah I'd say properly a year yeah, that's yeah. really great thank you mm -hmm. and who was the next we were heading up the back yeah um, you partially answered the question, or maybe fully, about I was going to ask about your uh, design pathway of where the project's going, the evolution. So maybe if there's anything more to say about that, but the, the other side of that is I'm um, looking at uh, uh, trying, to, um, trying to get a community-based education program to sort of broadly on the title of working title of curriculum for sustainable living. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're looking at collaborating with other projects to create more of this type yeah, of I mean community education <coughs> package. The, the idea of Speak Street is that it's totally scalable, almost like McDonald's or franchises, that there could yeah. be Speak Streets in any city in the country, in any city in the world, and that you would go in and have the same experience as you would in mine. So what I'm working on now is how can I ensure that that quality is maintained when yeah. it's not physically me delivering it. Yeah. So that, that's my vision, is that everybody would already know what Speak Street was and it would be um, a sort of an impetus for change. Um, part of the reason I had Jeremy Corbyn in, you know, involved is because I want this to be, I want to also influence policy, government policy, to be able to move from an agenda that is solely, solely focusing on immigration to integration. We don't have anything looking at that at the moment. So I would like to speak to to also be a political lobbying force to change mindsets around um, integration and migration. Coming around this side of the room now. Yep. Um, so it's, yeah. it's a social enterprise, so you know, generating revenue that you put back into the community way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you touched because I might have come in later, like how you know how you putting revenue, you know, how do you invest back into the community? I mean the service that you provide is already a you know community service for the model. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a one question, like you know if you like maybe that here. Yeah. Then in terms of the sustainable aspect of it. So uh, you mentioned that you can't live from from this and well, not, yet. At, not yet. <laughs> Uh, but you're also looking to expand, you mentioned the franchise model and so forth, but um, do you think it's sustainable to, under the current uh, revenue model that you have, to expand, to encourage and motivate people to start their own? Because remember, what you have is, is your passion, is your drive, you know, you're very passionate about it, 
you think there's going to be others that's as passionate without that financial, you know, financial um, you know, incentive? Um, so to answer the question, um, the, the revenue model, the big money that comes with this, comes from the corporate, from engaging with the corporates. That's where, um, otherwise it's going to be quite piecemeal and it's going to be nice, there's going to be community events, but that's not going to, you're not going to be able to live from that. But the, so my strategy is to focus on engaging with corporates because that is where the money is and then transfer that to cross subsidise the activities that are happening in the community. Um, in terms of structure, Speak Street is a, well, just nearly about to be incorporated as a community interest company, which is a structure here in the UK. I don't know if it's uh, similar in other countries. Um, it's somewhere probably between a company and a charity, um, whereas you have an asset lock, so you can't, I can't just sell it and then keep it for myself, but I can generate a profit and then that can be invested back into Speak Street. Um, is that all your questions answered? Well, what did I? Yeah, I mean, it just, uh, I mean, I think that's one of the things that <laughs> Joanna, and then um, you, and then you. Yeah. I think first I just want to really congratulate you on what you've done. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in your, in your sessions. Are the pe do, does the group that comes all take part in one <coughs> thing? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's an English session and there'll be English, people wanting to learn English, and the volunteers that are there are native English speakers. But the volunteers don't need to prep anything beforehand, um, that as long as they're native English speakers, because it's when it, the practice and the benefit for them is hearing how just everyday people speak English with their you know, changing grammar, their slangs, their sayings, whatever, is like hearing it pure from people in their own community. So in your sessions, is, sorry, it's a sort of follow-up question, but do the English people speak to each other and the others can hear what's going on? How do you actually interact with the non-English speakers, for example? Um, so they're generally, it's kind of a, it is a structured and facilitated session. It's not just kind of like talk to your neighbour sort of thing. Um, so there'll be a theme. It could be like a, a, a big thing in London is finding accommodation. So speaking with the landlord, we could do role plays and I could break people up into small groups or we can do a session together. I try and use a lot of arts and crafts as well, different mediums for people to engage, like we can draw things, and particularly because Speak Street, I think, is quite unique because we have people of different levels in the same session, and you know, if you go to a college to learn language, they're gonna um, judge which level you are and you'll be placed in a class, whereas here, everyone comes together, so I have to design activities that's going to push someone who's quite high level and not intimidate someone who's quite, you know, a low level. Thanks, Joanna. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really appreciate that you're working at, uh, at the age of culture, but um, do you make any trouble or any problems uh, or conflicts about the culture? Cultural difference? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't come across any any so far, I am quite sensitive that that could happen. Um, and I try and create a, a positive and neutral space. Um, for example, <coughs> I don't hold sessions in pubs because people might not, the, for many reasons, people might not feel comfortable in a pub setting, for example. Um, and so far, I haven't come across anything, uh, but I am mindful that I need to be aware if anything could come up and stuff. I mean, for some people, it's more common in their culture to hang out in a cafe and talk to people. For other people, that's just not done, and they would never do that. And for them, I'm trying to work so that I can go to local groups who already work with people in their own networks and do a session spe especially in their own environment. Because it's important that people feel comfortable in their environment. Thank you. This woman here, and then we've got um, five minutes, and hopefully we'll get to you. I noticed your hand was up, and John last. So let's see how we go. Um, I, I think I think it's two questions. Um, well, I'm what you're portraying, I can imagine it. Um, if you're doing it in the community, I can't quite imagine what you're doing in the corporate thing. You're not going to be encouraging them to talk about politics or oh. about the management and stuff like that, are you? Secondly, 
I can see you've got the talent to do it. Mm -hmm. And so what's and so if you expand, you've got to train other people, you know, get other people to have the talent to do it and fund them. So, you know, how's that? So firstly, with the corporates, obviously they don't want to practice their English because they can already speak English, even if their English isn't their first language. But what they want is an experience, for example, in their canteen area, in their lunch area, for one day for it to be Spanish day. Now, being here in London, a lot of corporate, global corporate com companies are accused of being UK-centric and London-centric. Everything's about London. So, so they often want to prove within their communications that they are very sensitive to the other um, parts of their business around the world. And uh, for English people to go on secondment to the other areas, they need to have the language skills to be able to do it. And English people or British uh, English speakers aren't known for their high levels of um, <laughs> language fluency. <laughs> Not all, but most. So um, there's an incentive for them. They also like it as an event. So you kind of go in, speak sheet's very fun. It's not like, um, it's complementary to any kind of formal learning. And it's learning through interacting. So we could ha we sometimes, we can have actors who kind of play out of a role play. There'll be food involved, there'll be drink involved. So for them, it's more of an event, um, an internal communications thing, as well as a way um, to give to corporate social responsibility and at the same time having something for them. Um, secondly, how am I going to expand? Um, it's true that there is, you know, I have to expand, I have to let it go, and it is a bit kind of like when I have like founders syndrome, and you're like, oh, it's mine, I can't let it go. But um, I'm confident, I've already met people, I'm confident that once I get the formula right, and I know what it is, and I could write it down, and I could tell you this is Speak Street, this is not Speak Street, that I, there are people who are very passionate about teaching English, their communities, and also um, in the political climate that we're in at the minute, there are people who feel very strongly about being able to help newcomers to the community, um, and it would just be a case for me to um, make sure that I recruit the right people and offer them the support. So I think it's very important that I focus on understanding what, what, why it is that Speak Street works so I can relay that to someone else. That's where I'm at right now. We've only got two minutes left, okay. so we'll do our best. Um, just a quick one. How do you uh, uh, advertise your events and link people up? Can you repeat your question? Uh, how do I advertise? I uh, use a lot of social media, so Facebook. Um, there's a thing in the UK that I think it's global actually called meetup.com, and I created a meetup group so people can come along. Word of mouth. I try and, again, use zoning, so like, my little community. At the beginning, I, I ignored my permaculture uh, zoning tendencies and I was like, here, 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 they're giving me free space. But then I realised I need to concentrate and just go near to my place so I can do often a little bits of um, sort of advertising and getting to know people and build relationships up with people. I'm also developing a strong network of partner organisations who can refer people and we can work together. Um, the next thing we're doing with English is we're going to be doing storytelling and we're going to create a performance at the end of it of all the stories through which people have shared with us in the sessions. Thank you. And John, it'll have to be a short Thank answer. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Ms. Basically, you know, it's really wonderful what you've done and everything. And inspiring, and what inspires me is there are so many different uh, walls in our society and so many potentials for integration. And have you ever thought about the kind of applications that may be possible way beyond the language barriers that often separate us into so many other fields which separate those communities? And this seems, I haven't quite got it, but it feels like something really exciting. Yeah, thank you. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Let's give Joanna a big clap. introduce you to Richard Webb. Okay. Yeah, let's get um, um, Yeah, if we can get this. I think just click to exit. I tried to keep where it Where is that? Where we are. Where's our person from the organisation <laughs> who might be able to instantly be a tech person? 
It says click to exit, it so um, it should be. escape to exit. I've got a um, presentation on here. So oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not mine. I'm in the bottom if you minimize it. <coughs> Sorry, actually, it should. Excuse us, everybody. So presentation is no, get richer. Yeah. Maybe take yeah. a moment to think about all the amazing no, that one? community organizations. No, that one. No, that one. Oh, okay. Oh. All right, so I'm going to stay. So is this one? Is it? Okay. Does anyone want to call theirs out? Let systems, anyone part of the let systems? Two people, is that all? Are you sure it's not going to be Yeah, that's the one that I'm to use this one. Transition down. Yeah, just go. Buying Fantastic. What about the intentional community living on land together or co-housing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is like me having a kind of challenge. Is it in one of these? Related to this session? Yeah. Maybe I'll tell you a little bit about Crystal Waters um, and the lady. I come from South East Queensland. How many people know Brisbane or Queensland in Australia? Where I live is um, often considered the home of cooperatives outside of Mondragon in Spain. It has more cooperatives than anywhere else in the world besides Mondragon. Yeah, it's show. quite amazing. We have three yeah, co-ops. Our, um, if I, if I go, if I go up to slide show, I can start a co-op using permaculture ethics. We've got Let Systems and this a Upfront yeah. Club, which is a co op club, and um, all kinds of other co ops too. So, yay! Right. But I get to introduce Richard. Wave to you now. Richard's um, been involved in landscape de design and environmental activities for 40 years and has taught permaculture in Hong Kong and Ireland for 25 years or so. And, yeah? And he's involved in an organisation called Grow It Yourself, which has 140 members. So he's going to share with us about that. So give Richard a welcome. Okay. Now let's see where we go. Um, let's try and sort this one out. Is that one? Okay. Go back again. Okay. Um, Grow It Yourself, GIY, is now an international movement to help people to grow food themselves. And that started 2009 in Ireland, down in Waterford in the southeast. Um, a guy called Michael Kelly is the founder, and he was out shopping one day and um, came across some garlic from China. And he thought, why on earth are we importing garlic all the way from China when we can grow it equally ourselves. And so he started to grow some vegetables in his own back garden, um, realised how much he didn't know, and got a few friends together who had a little bit more expertise, and they set up a little group called Grow Itself, GIY. Um, that went on for a couple of years, and he soon realised that if you're on an allotment or in a community garden, you can swap seeds, you can swap plants, swap experience, learn from other people, have a bit of crack and banter. But if you're growing in the solitude of your own backyard, you don't have that. And so he thought it'd be a really good idea to sort of expand this, uh, get backyard growers together so you, they can have those experiences more sort of a common experience. <coughs> and he set up a seminar a few years ago, in, again in Waterford. Loads and loads of people attended, and um, now we have at least, <coughs> excuse me, 40 uh, GOI groups in Ireland alone. There are groups in the UK, in Australia, uh, in the States, in Zimbabwe, and in Cambodia. So it has really expanded. Um, I suppose a bit like the transition town movement that um, uh, Rob Hopkins started from Kinsale in Cork. And so uh, lots of really good things come out of Ireland. Now, where are we? 
You don't really need to tell you all this stuff. Um, our food is a growing problem. We've got diet-related diseases now, uh, more than infectious diseases. Um, Two-thirds of Irish adults are overweight or obese. Um, Ireland has the highest rate of overweight and obese children under five years old in Europe. This has huge implications for diabetes, for cancer. Um, this is a European problem, maybe a, a global problem now. So what is the solution? In GIY, we talk about food empathy. Um, I'm not quite sure I have empathy for a turnip, but uh, <laughs> the idea is that if you're growing food yourself, you understand the value of that. You understand the flavor, the taste, the freshness, which you don't get off something on the supermarket shelf. Now, if you're growing your own sweet corn, as you know, it is sweet corn. And the butter dribbles down your mouth when you eat it. Whereas you buy it from a supermarket, it's like eating a piece of cardboard. So you get this deeper understanding of food, the provenance of food, the value of food, when you grow it yourself. This little lad is uh, Mike Kelly's son, shelling beans. And he said, Dad, we've really got to save some of these beans so we can grow some next year. Now, he got it. He got the message. So it's a not-for-profit -for organization. Um, we've supported over 65,000 people this year uh, and different community uh, food growing projects. Now, let's see if we can get that one. That's it. We have a number of different projects in GIY which have sort of grown exp exponentially. Uh, it's GIY at home. And this is a program that is encouraging families to grow food themselves in their own gardens. Um, and there is uh, mentoring, uh, certainly online, and that's uh, 15,000 people involved in that. There's the GIY Sow and Grow Schools campaign, um, and that's involved 100,000 children around the country over the last three years. There's two parts to that. There's one is the actual grow, uh, setting up and growing school gardens. And we have probably about 70 school gardens around the country at the moment. And um, the other, is the sow and grow part of it is more sort of classroom based where your, uh, the children are sowing cut and come again in troughs and putting in the windowsill. So it's much more sort of classroom based. But you've got to start somewhere. There's the uh, Give Peas a Chance campaign, um, where we've got employees growing food within their own work environment. And again, that can be setting up a little sort of garden, um, or it can be sowing um, cut and come again in the windowsill, or sprouting, which again, you could do on a windowsill. And we've got over 500 companies taking part in that. Some of the big ones there, Diageo, which own Guinness. Um, Aramark, which is one of the biggest food companies um, in the world, um, who also run a couple of our um, refugee detention centers in Ireland. But uh, that's another story. Um, we've got GIY in the community, and that's the Get Ireland Growing Fund sponsored by the Allied Irish Bank over the last three years. So um, some banks are doing some good things. Um, so it's 400 community food projects around Ireland uh, been involved with that. Excuse me. We have what we call the GIY theory of change. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have the problem the impact of our food chain on our health and the impact of the food chain on the environment, and you know all this stuff. So what is the solution? Is more GIY, more grow it yourself. The barriers are the lack of skills and support, lack of motivation, people may not have large enough gardens or no gardens at all, and very often today a lack of time. The strategy is inspiring people to grow it yourself 
and supporting people to do that. And what we do within GIY, the strategic activities, we have GIY groups. And that is the core of GIY. As I said, we have about 40 uh, groups in Ireland. And uh, I'm coordinator of the Bray GIY group. Bray is a little ta seaside town about 15 miles south of Dublin on the east coast. And we've been going, I suppose, as long as GIY has, really. And we would have about 150 people on our email list, not all of which come to all of our meetings by any means, but um, we, we get the message out to people. And the way that the groups are, tend to be structured is that we would have um, monthly meetings, um, and we would invite a speaker in to talk about some aspect of growing our own food. And this could be everything from seed saving, um, biodynamics, uh, beekeeping, chickens. Our biggest attendant was on uh, peak keeping. So it can, can be anything, really. And those speakers would be sort of national experts or the experts that we know are within our own locality. And you'd all have people like that. And uh, we also uh, have resurrected an old Irish word called the mehel, which is where a neighbour supports his neighbour to bring in the harvest and vice versa. So in other words, if somebody's putting up a polytunnel, we come together and help them. If they're setting up a raised bed, we do the same. Uh, sorry? How do you spell it? Oh, how do you spell it? That's a good one. Um, M E I T H E A L. Mehel. M I. Sorry, M E I T H E A L. There's no Irish speakers here. <laughs> Thank God for that. One more time. I think I said. M E I T H E A Mehel. Mehel. Anyway. Um, and also in, in the summer, we have uh, visits to gardens. Now, these, these are gardens within our own group or visits to people who we know have very good gardens, and we learn a huge amount from that. There are the GIY programs that I've just mentioned. Uh, most of those will be supported by some of the larger companies. Um, various GIY events. The, the, the main one is actually on at the moment, which is the gathering down in Waterford, uh, where all the groups come together. And again, we have national and international experts. Joy Larkin, of course, who's the doyen of vegetable growers. Um, Mark Diacono, Alice Fowler, and so forth. Uh, we have GIY publications, so we have a, a magazine for paid-up members. Um, Mike Kelly has just produced a book called Grow, Cook, Eat, which tells you what to sow, how to grow, what to harvest each month of the year. And then we have, that's for each month, there's a number of recipes by some of the top chefs in Ireland to go, go with all that in terms of the seasonality of the food. Um, the other one is Grow HQ. Um, and we're in the fundraising stage of that. That will be down in Waterford again, South East Ireland. And that will be a demonstration centre for backyard growing. Um, so we'd have a demonstration gardens, we'd have lecture facilities, we'd have uh, uh, a cookery teaching classroom as well, as well as the administrative headquarters. So we're, we're fundraising for that at the moment. Five minutes, which is okay. Um, I'll just mention we have uh, garden visits, um, so this will be my own forest garden in Bray, which I th I'm claiming is the oldest in Ireland, it's been going for 25 years. And, um, <laughs> okay, thank you for that. And um, yeah, we would for, for the garden visits we would, um, or certainly for this one we use it to uh, um, talk about or, or to demonstrate uh, pruning fruit, apples, fruit trees, 
uh, the use of herbs, um, and what forest gardens are about. DIY is not specifically permaculture. Our aim is to get people growing, and then we gradually uh, introduce the, the sort of permaculture ideas. And again, visits to other people's gardens um, are extremely valuable. Uh, this is one in down in Ashford in, in Withflow, and the, the, the lady who runs it um, ha is a permaculturalist, and um, she is the only person I, I know in, the, in Ireland who is actually growing large fruiting kiwis outdoors on her um, fence around the chicken run. She has a young family, so she hasn't got a great deal of time to involve in it, in growing, so she doesn't freeze anything. Everything she grows is, is uh, seasonal. And, uh, oh, sorry, it's come out very well. School gardens, we would I said, have about uh, 60 or 70 school gardens around the country, and um, we've got about 160 community gardens. Um, a lot of them are obviously are urban based. So Mick Kelly is up there on the top left. Is some of the people who are involved with uh, the administration that make it all work. And uh, a lot of support from Darina Allen from the Ballymaloe Cookery School you might have heard of. Um, GOI is one of the most important initiatives that come out of Ireland in the last 20 years. So I'm um, not sure Rob Hopkins would agree with that, but uh, there we go. Um, <laughs> So that is all I really want to say. That is um, some background information. The website is uh, giyinternational.org. Um, there's a number of these leaflets here, so please take one. Um, if you have any questions, or if you're interested in setting up a GIY group wherever you are, we can certainly help you with that. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Necessarily, but I know certain groups would do that. Yes, it just depends on what the situation is with their with their own area. What we're doing in, in Bray, for example, um, we've got funding from the GIY Get Ireland Growing Fund to um, plant a small number of fruit trees in about 20 schools in Bray, and that's part of um, a larger project. Uh, the Edible Bray project, which is based on the Todd Morden scheme that you probably heard about. And that's a sort of a spin-off from our own group. So each group tends to do things slightly different. So I, I know that kind of thing does happen as well. Yes. And she's designing a curriculum that teachers can use. And she thinks that actually, if the teachers are trained up in this curriculum, it actually adds to their CV. Have you yeah. thought of doing something like that? Um, I know that is practiced. Now, I'm, I think now uh, food growing and horticulture is now going to be part of the curriculum. There have been various changes. Um, they've been fiercely resisted by teachers. Um, but I, th I know some of that already takes place. But on what sort of scale, I'm not too sure. But I, I think there's more of that going to, to come in. And I think you've, you've also had that change here recently in, in your own curriculum, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Peter, we're ready for food growing Yeah, the, the, the website, the GIY website, has a huge range of information on. 
It will tell you where all the different JOI groups are, when their meetings are, and, and what the meetings will be about. Um, there is online information on food growing, cropping, what to do that, that particular month or week or whatever. And we have people like Klaus Leitenberger who would have a, a column of, of advice as well. So that's on, as I say, uh, JOIinternational.org. A huge amount of information there. Um, can other organisations help administer a GIY project? So, if you like an environmental charity to a local community gardens, do a GIY, start a GIY group with the community? Is that something yeah, that absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, Did everyone hear the question up the back? Could you repeat the question? Um, sorry, can other groups get involved or start GIY projects? Is that it? Yeah. Um, it's very, very flexible. Um, you know, we, we, we would like people to be members, but they don't have to be. The groups themselves don't have a chairman, a secretary, and a treasurer. So most groups don't sort of hold money to do things. Everything is voluntary. Um, and as I say, it's, it's very flexible. So you know, if you want to, to um, avail of the GIY information that's on the website, yeah, by all means. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you gradually introduced permacultural permaculture ideas. Uh, how do you what how do you do that? What, what um, that? Gradually. <laughs> Maybe um, speak the question. Yeah, how do you introduce yeah. permaculture ideas? Um, well, I, I when I'm sort of giving uh, presentations myself, I'll obviously talk about permaculture and some of the the background information on that. We have had speakers in to specifically talk about the permaculture approach to growing. Um, when people come round to the garden, we, I show them the forest garden and, and the sort of structure and why things are where they are. And um, that seems to uh, be the main sort of introduction, really. We haven't got round to running permaculture courses, and, and I don't see that we would do, because there are other people who, who do that very effectively, who are involved in the GIY movement themselves. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, not specifically organic. Are we? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Are they organic? Yeah. We do have uh, a lot of support from a company called Woody's, which is one of these big sort of uh, DIY chains. And um, we've had them to come and speak to us, and they themselves are now phasing out their various sort of garden chemicals. And they're going much more towards the, the organic side, but virtually all of the people that are involved with GIY would be organic growers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I understand that um, DIY is a growing thing, and I'm interested to know who provides seeds and if it is DIY. How consistent is that um, to keep you guys going? Uh, Can you repeat the question? You're interested in where do we get our seeds from? Yeah. In, uh, and sorry, could you repeat that again? You said, um, is it DIY provide seeds for schools, for instance, schools and homes? And if it is DIY, um, how, how consistent do you guys do? Um, okay, in terms of the, the seeds, we, can, we, we do produce seeds for school projects. Um, many of the seeds we get would be from um, organic seed groups. Uh, we teach seed, so, uh, seed saving as well. Um, so we've got a number of um, seed producers within Ireland like um, brown envelope seeds and others and they would provide their vegetable seeds to us for the schools. Free? Um, subsidised cost? There will be a, a, a subsidised small amount, yeah. yeah, yeah. One more question? Yeah, um, so do you that's a my question. Do you encourage people, members in GIY to 
say there's this value on own cells. If yes, how, the, how is this going? Okay, do we encourage people to save their own seed? We do. Um, that depends on what you want to save, of course. Things like um, beans, um, tomatoes, peas, relatively easy to do that. If you're talking about brassicas, it's much more difficult to do it on a home scale because they interbreed so much and you need to separate one variety from another by quite a distance. Now there are people like the Irish Seed Savers Association who do that, uh, and they are the guys who grow all the heritage varieties uh, of um, you know, the Irish kales and cabbages and this kind of thing. So you know, th there are resources where we can get those those seeds from. Thank you. Yeah. Just one last question up the back here. So um, first of all, I, what a great initiative and fantastic that you've been so successful, and thank you for sharing with us. Um, so I'm living in Cyprus and I'm working with um, schools and uh, community groups there. I'm wondering what are the advantages to becoming a member of GIY and how could GIY support what we're doing there? Or is it just that I would access your website, I've gone on it and it looks very, very comprehensive? Would it be just that kind of um, using the resources that you put online? Or is there, the website's called GIY International, I'm wondering yeah. what that means and how we collaborate. Okay, uh, it's a good question. Um, there's a lot of information on the website, certainly. Um, we would encourage people to, to form their own group um, because you can bring people together, you can get your local knowledge and experience, which is often maybe isolated sort of within the community. You know, somebody working away for the last 50 years on their allotment or something has huge experience. Um, and it's wonderful to, to, to get that knowledge, or if they're a beekeeper, for example. Yeah. You know? And you can really only get that with a group that comes together and shares that information. Now, we, we can certainly help you to, you know, give you the background to get that sort of group together and how to run uh, meetings and this kind of thing. Okay. All right? Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, you can talk to me afterwards. And you had a question. Well, just coming on from that really is that um, so okay, I get you know half a dozen of my friends together. We've got a little bit of land nearby, and we want to set up a, a food growing project. Yeah. Um. So and so we form a, a GRI group, yeah. but then we're individual members. Does everyone in in the group have to be a member of GIY? Um, no, it doesn't. I mean, this is a yeah. This is a bit of a paradox that we have. Yeah, this is a bit of a paradox we have at the moment because ideally, GIY want everybody to pay their twenty five euros or whatever it is to join. Not everybody does, but it still trundles on. You know. Um, yes, you, you can do that. Though. Yeah, the, the so support the support would again could come from the website or directly asking GIY. Yeah, how do you do X, Y, Z? And you get that information. Yeah. So it sounds like you two need to have a cup of tea together. The, the, yeah. the support that you're giving, you know, you're, you're supporting groups in doing this. Yes. The support is in the form of, apart from information and access to the website, it's, is there financial support or, you know, like say, the subsidised seeds or all that support? Yeah. Um, as an individual, you can get. Yeah, the support would come from things like the Get Ireland Growing campaign, um, which would be open to anybody, to be honest, not just in Ireland, uh, for specific projects. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Let's say okay. Yeah. okay, thanks very much.
organisation. He's the board chair of Transition US and he's on the steering committee of the NorCal Community Resilience Network. And he says he works to harness the wisdom of nature and power of community to rebuild personal and community resilience. And he says that he grows food, medicine and wonder while working to compost apathy and lack. Yes. <laughs> I really love that. So I wanted to read it word for word. So let's welcome Trayton. Thank you, Robin. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I could sometimes be challenging on native, native English speakers, and I know Joanne and Richard modeled excellently, but I could get talking quick and I'm inspired, and I'm gonna go through a bunch of slides and a bunch of stories, and so just go like this if you need me to slow down. <laughs> or remember to pause and breathe. And so I'm largely gonna, you know, the essence of what I'm gonna really talk about, sort of true to permaculture, is you know, starting with ourselves. Uh-oh, it looks like there's some mix-up in the slides, so we'll see how that works out. But, uh, you know, really starting to sort of the Gandhi and be the change, affecting change with ourselves at home where we live as a really key piece, but then also very critical to go out and do this in our communities. And, you know, like what Rob Hopkins and the transition movement talk about is to build resilient and healthy and just communities. A cornerstone of that is personal resilience, of doing these things at home, engaging neighbors and friends, showing up at our city council meetings and things like that. A second piece for me is to really grow effective, high-impact, financially viable organizations and networks to bring resources in the movement so we could hire people to do good work. It's not all about money, but it's an important nutrient to help us move things forward. Um, and so, yes, this has definitely moved around a little bit. And so Daily Acts Organization is a permaculture-based nonprofit sustainability group. And we really look at, we kind of have a guild of programs and everything from doing presentations to sharing our work. And from presentations, then we go out and we do permaculture tours and sustainability tours to give people the smell and the touch and the taste and the voice and the face of this healthy, just world being born. From there, we say, okay, let's get together and let's do stuff. Let's actually transform things. Let's install gray water systems. Let's install rainwater catchment systems. Let's show people how to do bees. From there, we get people together, 20, 30, 50, 200 people, and then we actually do landscape transformations. Let's install a front yard garden or a public food forest. And then from there, our last program is the Community Resilience Challenge, which is a community scale mobilization that I'll touch on more that anybody here could apply at home. Uh, we also do a lot of work with, we work a lot with local governments and we're involved in a lot of different sort of alliances and networks. And as Robin mentioned, that's the work I do where I live in Sonoma County in Northern California and then we're working regionally to support the movement and then nationally. And then as hopefully some of you will be there, we have the International Transition Towns Conference, which is next weekend in the UK that I know some of us will be attending. <clears throat> and so, you know, the, the be the model start at home kind of it was great to see Richard's theory of change slide. For me, I got, I got exposed to an incredible permaculture teacher and I was waking up to the overwhelming scale of the problems and I started meeting these people that they just seemed more alive and they weren't just complaining about what was wrong, but they were actually purposeful and passionately engaged and they were regenerating nature and farms and doing this incredible work. From there, I got, went to a conference called the Bioneers Conference, which is a bunch of incredibly inspiring speakers. And I was there with a room of 2,000 people, 2,000 of these folks. And so I got the need for a community of permaculturists of inspired allies and the third piece that clicked into place for me was stepping into the backyard at the Permaculture Institute in Northern California. And you could hear people talk about this stuff, but it was just this direct transmission of fecundity of this living, breathing, regenerated system that was right in someone's backyard. And so those three core references for me kind of frame up our theory of change, that we have to expose people to alive, engaged people who are doing this work, who are creating models of sustainability and permaculture, and we need to build communities of practice and support around that. <clears throat> and so, in Toby Hemingway's book, Gaia's Garden, he talks about this point when an ecological garden just goes pop, and it surges with vitality, and it's able to sift, sort, and transform any drop of water, any ray of sunshine, any scrap of carving into this thriving, resilient ecosystem. And those elements are building soil by doing things like sheet mulching, a great permaculture technique, and composting. It's treasuring every drop of water, 
This is a friend's backyard permaculture garden with bioswales and pond systems and food going through it. It went from asphalt, a third of an acre of asphalt, to this ratcheted up food forest in two years. And they even are harvesting the water off the apartment complex above them. They put in a gate valve it was going under their property, all this water was going away. And so then they open up this gate valve and storm events and harvest tens of thousands of gallons of water by moving it through this property. It's rainwater catchment, it's gray water systems, things like that. Um, a beneficial diversity of plants and critters are really critical pieces as well. And then more conscious human stewards, building and retrofitting green and natural. Lots of slides missing. I actually switched this out to the one with the better <laughs> setup. And so when we get these elements in place, that's when that whole system goes pop. And so that's my wife up on the left. And this is mainly in about a year when we moved in from our place of using 60, 70, 80% less resources. We could talk about these things, but to expose people of what this fecundity could be like, to give them that direct connection. And not just that, that we could change the world in a garden, saving water, saving energy, influencing local, regional even state policies. Um, because the, as you all know, the thinking that we learn at home in these solutions, that ecological design thinking <clears throat> can be scaled up to larger scales. And so we teach people how to do this at their home scale, but we also look at, this is uh, across the street from my house, and this is where we installed the first nor uh, food forest in Northern California in 2009. And it was just this big unused patch of lawn pesticides, chemicals, lawnmower smog. And so we talked to our city, and rather than just ripping out the turf and taking it away, um, until recently, state best practice in California, you get paid to remove your turf. And of course, 500 years of topsoil with it, versus sheet mulching, building soil in place. And so we talked the city into not just doing that, but said, let's plant a food force, this ecological garden that's food, medicine, habitat, beauty. Let's engage and educate citizens. Let's harvest the rain. Let's put in cob benches. And so we brought out over 150 people over three days and transformed this landscape. And when the head of the water department came by with his kids in his arm and it was 85 degrees, which I don't know in Celsius, but it's hot, but 85 degrees and people are laughing and having fun and they're digging these earthworks in clay. He was kind of like, what's going on here? What is this? And so we'll see if the video works. But this is the house next to that food forest. Um, that doesn't look like it's on there. <clears throat> it's a rapid animation that shows 30 people transforming this landscape in a day. Sheet mulching, um, using the fallen down broken wall in the front, integrating the down spouts to grow blueberries. And the amazing thing about this is the people who live there used to sit on their porch behind, everybody would walk by, and we find this again and again and again. They're saving water, they're doing all these great soil building activities, and every single person that walks by stops and talks to them and they've actually changed their values. They buy things differently. And they talked about how um, on the day of, it felt like the day of their wedding when 30 people came together and transformed their landscape. And I, I live there, so I see this again and again. Everybody stops, it builds immense community. And so after doing these things, we got the opportunity to take it to City Hall. And we partnered with two other organizations, and it was on the, in 2009, on the largest day of climate action in the planet's history from 350.org. And between the three groups, we mobilized 250 volunteers and transformed the city hall landscape in a day. About 25,000 square feet of turf, saved the city $60,000, a million gallons of water, bioswales, Chilean guava berries, rain tanks, and community garden beds at the entrance to city hall. We've since done another city hall landscape and pressured one of the bigger cities to get the funding to do theirs. And then there's a fourth one that we're in process on right now. Um, and so it's amazing to get to partner with municipal agencies and so since we got to start doing these things, instead of ripping out the turf and take it away, we worked the city to launch this mulch madness program where they give free materials basically to sheet mulch, free local compost, cardboard. And since they started doing that, they've provided free resources to sheet mulch over 500 lawns in our city, which saves about 25 million gallons of water a year, not to mention the topsoil and the support of local businesses and the cluster effect of neighbors connecting with neighbors and doing this as well. And so we start to look around now, and from our efforts and other activities and this sort of uh, force that's occurring, you see two, three, four front yard gardens on every block, and it's affecting significant culture change, as well as the political change. And so we start growing a sheet mulching movement, and this is the library and other people's front yards, and city officials are getting involved. Um, and it's becoming, sheet mulching is becoming fully commonplace. I hear elected officials talk about sheet mulching now. 
And so then we start moving around the county and partnering with other organizations and schools. This is 30 students who installed a public food forest with us in another city. This is a police station. This is a mayor of the town helping out. This is another city hall landscape. We partnered with a business called Permaculture Artisans and designed this edible living learnscape. It's the most popular visited destination in West County. Uh, and so there's all these edible educational components that go back to the history of the place. And so that's going, okay, we could take sheet mulching and start to bring that out to scale and public food force and start to mainstream those. And so similarly with gray water, we installed the first permitted household gray water system in Sonoma County. I met a permaculture design engineer at a class and said, great, you have a civil engineer stamp. Will you come and help design the system? And so we installed a constructed wetland gray water system like the food forest, mimicking this wetland ecology. There's a little whole food shopping basket underneath the Buddha to collect the, uh, you know, some of the waste bits that come through. And after doing that, that enables to get involved with our county and a working group that participated with a number of other groups in updating the California state gray water policy, including Laura Allen, incredible permaculturist, you know, starting in backyards and that having an influence all the way up to state policy. Then from there, so we went back and said, great, we have a new state policy, it's better. Now we could work with the cities and we'll do five gray water systems in our neighborhood in a day and 13 in two cities in a weekend. And then we did a 100 gray water system challenge after that. And so, you know, still thinking as we've heard this morning, big challenges, heavy times, lots of need to adapt and step up. So a small group of us, Daily Acts and Transition Sebastopol and some other groups, again, about five, six years ago, got together with this idea that kind of, you know, when we think of something that inspires and scares the hell out of us, we're like, ooh, that's the place to lean into. And so our idea was to plant 350 gardens in a weekend. And at first we were afraid to even say this. You know, it seemed like such a big daunting goal, but with 17 weeks of organizing, we got all the cities, the schools, churches, businesses on board, our water agency backed us um, and gave us some funding. And collectively we planted and revitalized 628 gardens in our place. And building political power, right? Putting public wind in the political sails. And getting, you know, being even permaculturists that thinking we learn in the backyard to get the water people thinking about food and the food think people thinking about energy. Just now it's super commonplace, but just taking that more integrated holistic approach like folks have mentioned today. So the next year, you know, we ratcheted up to a thousand home and garden actions as the goal. And, you know, again, like we, we didn't pull this all right. We set a big scary goal and the community rises to the challenge with a little bit of support, a little bit of inspiration and a call to action that unifies. And so one of the groups, um, you know, other folks started to hear about this and they wanted to replicate it or do it. So we're like, great, grab and run. And so one time I was out in my backyard in the garden with a gal from another organization. She came and visited and we were pruning and grafting fruit trees. And I just laid out what the program was and said, open source, take everything you want, run with it. And they, a you know, small group of people, mainly volunteers, stepped up and they registered a thousand home and garden actions their first year at it. Um, and so then we partnered with Transition US to do it nationally as well. Uh, and these are numbers from a couple years ago, but you know, actions in a couple hundred different cities and states, even some folks from around the world found out about it and registered as well. And so then locally, we just kept on building capacity, building relationships, building networks, building action, building gardens, and kept on going up 2,300 actions, 3,500. Um, you know, and so as lots of groups are wanting to replicate it, you know, but everybody's just doing their own thing, and so it's very disparate. And so last year, we looked at of saying, okay, well, and you know, just really key aspect, community aligned in acts of care and celebration. To be able to set big goals as a community and step into them, given the times, to feel that in our DNA, what that means is so vital. Uh, missing slide. Um, and so we, we rebranded it to the Be the Community Resilience Challenge to have a focus on shared language, shared branding, shared measurable results, but local autonomy. So we have a very simple platform. You could register actions many in the world. You could grab um, materials, whatever you'd want to do. So this is just one of 7,000 local actions in our community last year. And this lawn was using about 16,000 gallons of water a month, which I don't know the local alternative, but if you stack five gallon buckets up, that's about two and a half times the height of the Empire State Building. And they just didn't know. And they, you know, they got the call to take action. And they partnered with Weeding Earth, a great local permaculture business and organization. 
um, you know, collaboration, we're not doing this all. And so they're saving all of that water and they install this beautiful edible native habitat garden. They put in community benches, they put in a, a free lending library, and now they literally have kids' bands showing up at their house. They walk out the door and there's young girls who are eating strawberries and reading books from the library on the bench. And they said, you know, there's all these great ecological benefits, but again, the community piece. They met more neighbors since they did this in three months last year and in three decades of living in this house. And so we kind of hear these stories again and again. And so, you know, imagine that. Last year when we rebranded, we hit over 16,000 actions, projects, and pledges. This year, over 21,000 actions, projects, and pledges. And so, you know, setting those scary goals of, you know, we're afraid to even say the word the first time. And because people just mobilize from all over, again, us not doing it all, community stepping up, we've registered over 100 times our original goal from groups all over the place participating. And so, and this is something you all could take with you in your communities and, and implement it and make it better and teach us lessons. And so just a couple quick touchings on things we're doing now because we start to build the success and relationships and political support and all those things. This is a program that got approved recently by our county supervisors. Um, and we're partnering with a local youth development organization, a couple county agencies. And so these eight youth, we have them out there every day. The goal is to do transform 30 lawns in 30 days and to create model gardens at churches in one of the city hall landscapes. And so they're learning permaculture skills. They're out there in neighborhoods. They've already sheet mulched 15,000 square feet of turf just in the last couple weeks. Uh, and another project that we're working on that a partner organization that got involved with us, they took the lead and started running. And so we're support on a project they're organizing. They're a commercial real estate company. And so they're starting to organize to transform business parks. And we're going to be working together in October to sheet mulch a 65,000 square foot turf, uh, which is like an acre and a half maybe. And they're going to have fans and all kinds of efforts. Uh, and so it's great watching these things get adopted throughout the community and through, you know, effective collaboration. You don't have to do all this yourself with your, by yourself or with your organization. There's so many people that have aligned efforts. And with that permaculture thinking of relationships and integrate rather than segregate, there's really a lot of collective power that we could leverage together. And so we're just doing our part where we live and partnering nationally and doing some partnering internationally um, and really working to just grow this movement. And so you could join the challenge. We'd love to, it's, it's next spring is when it happens. Um, we're more o organizing locally. Transition US is the national hub organization. And it'd be great, I'll talk with the folks next week at the Transition Network if we could get them to be the body for organizing international efforts. Uh, and then lastly, just a really important piece of it, you know, taking care of yourself, practicing regenerative hedonism, um, you know, modeling that you're lit and alive and aligned with the, the larger truths of this time. I sat next to Marco this morning, and he just took a permaculture design course and quit his job and a technology career to step into this, whatever this is, right? You know, and so, yeah, Andrew Marco is right there. Um, And so, yeah, you're just thinking about that. Like, what, what scares you about stepping up of times that by 10 or 100 and think that it doesn't have to take that much more capacity or effort? And we can fund this work. Our phone is ringing off the hook. And so we really want to, not in our work, but to bring resources into the movement so we could be able to staff up our organizations and networks. Um, and I have a sign-up list being an organizer. If uh, anybody's interested, you could come up here and sign. And other than that, thank you so much. still, you know, it happens in a lot of different ways depending on the situation. And that's something we're experimenting with from organizers ourselves. So with some of the city landscapes, like the food forest I showed, we partner with the city of Petaluma and they hire us to run programs. Over, third, over a third of our budget comes from government contracts to run permaculture programs, basically. 
And so we do regular activities there. Um, we just did a big elderberry harvest workshop and prunings and all sorts of things. And so that's one aspect of, we just, I met with a developer, probably the second largest developer in the county recently, and he wants to put this at the heart of the next 20,000 units he's putting in and provide an ongoing engagement strategy. Um, you know, neighbors, like our neighbors, they just do it themselves. We don't really get, I live there so they ask me questions, but there's a lot of people who are just implementing these projects in places. Um, you know, school and community garden networks, we have existing networks where we live. And so we're really, you know, it's kind of really a range of strategies from the, this is the inspired call to action. We are not a backbone. We have nine staff um, to manage it all, but to support people to do that. Um, there's hiring local businesses. A lot of permaculture design companies actually get jobs out of our work because people do this stuff and they want to hire someone or municipal agencies. And then a piece that I got from Permaculture UK folks in Cuba is that next leveling our network. And so we're in the process of formalizing homegrown guilds in each of our communities. And that would be a support to not us even be teaching things anymore, but like supporting citizens and model sites to do it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's great that it's so much positive going on. Uh, one of the problems to get out is that uh, if people ask, where can I get some examples? That uh, yeah, you can give them uh, 15 different web pages. Mm -hmm. So I'm coordinating a global network with the uh, name More and Better, More and Better for Agricultural Rural Development. And together with some other organizations, we created a web page called agtransition.org, no. where we encourage people, and it's not flagging any organization, it's just promoting the organizations that want to promote their own stuff. Mm. So I just uh, encourage you, I'll give you the more yeah, details. That sounds good, yeah. Everyone can put uh, their own stuff there, and we list all the organizations. So you can tell people, okay, here you can uh, search for different kind of, of uh, sustainable agriculture and good initiatives to show really uh, what is going on around the world because uh, the impression people get through many uh, newspapers and so on is that okay this is some, some, something small a little bit here and there but it's not a big impact so <coughs> we need to promote this together uh, so uh, I encourage all of you that have examples to go for this I have a link that you can get uh, off the media it's ag-transition.org ag yeah. Um, going back to your original 350 yep. target, you know, you said 350, how did you actually get the word out to all those people? I mean, I think your numbers are just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I imagine, you know, if, if I try to do that in my community, mm -hmm. I'd get 10 people, you know, mm -hmm. and then perhaps 10 of their friends might, you know. Um, yeah. How did you actually get the word out to those people? Kind of a, a combo. So one, we our organization existed for six or so years before, so we built up pretty good social networks of running educational programs and doing media. We partnered with other organizations who had bases. Um, you know, we built up good relationships in the media by doing these things. Keep the energy in the system. If you do anything, are you following up with people? Are you following up with the media contacts? Those little things to build relationships and build our informal networks. Uh, and then just an inspiring call to action. You know, is really helpful if that infectious enthusiasm spreads. And so kind of that common, we've been astonished to see just a person or two, the reach they've been able to have, but feeling a part of something larger, because if you just did it by yourself, maybe you'd kind of be not sure, be like, I'm a part of this bigger thing, and you'd come from a different place with it, so. And did you have staff, uh, did you have full-time volunteers, full-time? Initially, we got $20,000 in funding from our water agency, and we didn't. Um, you know, we've been built, able to build up, our, build up our budget to, we're a $600,000 organization now. And so now, you always need to do more, but we do have full-time staff who can work on it. And we just, a new organization that's a California Governor's Initiative on Climate Change has just partnered with us. And they're not, we're not getting money out of it, but they're bringing $250,000 with the fellowship staff in 50 people across nine regions to implement this. Um, and so there's, there's resources out there. You know? It was pre-drought, and so really people are, my experience is they're more centered around food, 
by partnering with municipal agencies through water, we then say, yes, we'll take care of your conservation, but we'll hit storm water and all these other pieces. And so we kind of stack functions, but food is really the more interesting thing in our experience for most people. But now in California, we're in a severe drought, so water is number, you know, and just hearing what, what is their thing, it almost doesn't matter what it is from a holistic perspective, you know, you could weave it together. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. Yep. If, if um, you go, but I think it's fine. There's two more. Cool. Um, the, um, I'm hearing w within what you're saying that, that water is a, an issue for local government and that they're prepared to put bucks into it. Um, that doesn't happen so much in Australia, I say, is it? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So th that's a significant part of um, how you process this managed to be so for us, but you know, if the challenge is organized around grow food, save water, conserve energy, reduce waste, build community. And so our thing is like you could take this and apply this to anything from a design perspective to do the presentations and the tours and the workshops and the mobilization. It could be energy if that's what's up in your place. It could be you could come in through whatever angle from a holistic perspective. For us in California, water is a big driver um, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So. There, you know, so two parts that when we did our gray water system because we pointed to another model, I think that's one of the best strategies for anything. Point to other things that work, like in our area now, and we're trying to develop materials for that because the head of the water agency, our commerce people, all these people are bought in and they drank, you know, they drank the Kool Aid at this point. They get it, they understand the importance. And so even for them, that reduces a bar barrier for municipal agencies. If your agency hears other high level elected officials or whatever going, like, look, this works. You or I could say it all day long and it's not going to matter, but when the head of an award-winning agency says it or a congressperson or whatever, I don't know what translates across countries, but showing examples and then getting the, you know, speaking to their listening and, you know, what their barriers are. And I think government funding is a huge opportunity for a lot of us. And I never would have thought we'd get government funding, honestly, or do the things we're doing. And so don't totally discount that you can't get funding from the government. But is there examples I could use? Do you have data? So data, so that's a great point, sorry. You know, for small nonprofits, in most cases, it's not realistic. We're not the type of institutions that have the ability to get data. You really, we, to the degree that we have registered results and all of that info, and then, you know, like when we sheet mulch lawns, we have those numbers. We transform 200,000 square feet of turf, which equals X millions of gallons of water. You know, or like the 500 lawns from the city that got transformed, we got data on those sort of things, okay. for sure. Okay. Um, so I could contact you and maybe get some of that information. So yes, and, and also too, like for me to try and figure out what things do we need to be teeing up for other people just to make it easier. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and how quick is your question? Because you did have your hand up, and I don't want to leave you out, but we need to wind up. The, the, the question's been partly answered, and that you very quickly said how many um, hectares of turf uh, or lawns that you sheep marched over. Um, there's a sort of like, our lawns are cultural thing in the US. A what? Cultural thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think it started over here, didn't it? Thanks, everyone. That was a great session. Thanks for yeah. the